Welcome back to the afternoon session for the day. As a first announcement, we have a pair of errant car keys. I don't know if they belong to anyone. I mean, I'm sure they belong to someone. <laughs> I don't know if that person's here. It seems to be a Toyota. No, wait, or a Chevy. <laughs> or there's two cars. <laughs> okay. Um, Christine's going to hold on. Okay, I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Shalom Gooden. Uh, she is an associate professor and former chair of linguistics at the <laughs> University of Pittsburgh. Uh, she serves in, as an executive on the executive board of the Society for Pidgin and Creole Linguistics uh, Languages, the advisory board for creative multilingualism and has served on panels of granting agencies. Her research focuses on the prosodic classification and intonational phonology of Caribbean English Creoles and sociocultural aspects of language use. She has published on morphophonology, intonation and prosody in Jamaican Creole, Trinidadian Creole, Yami, intonation, language and identity in Pittsburgh AAE, and sociophonetic aspects of AAE. All right, thank you. All right, so as the title says, and what you would have read, can you hear me well? Um, bridging the field and the lab, and I must confess that as I was thinking about this, um, I flipped the order of the words. <laughs> so I started problematizing my topic and realized that I had thought I had solved the problem before. So I thought of it as, from the lab to the field. And with that perspective, I thought that there's something wrong here. Because exploration of linguistic variation is a major concern of the subfields that I am claimed to have expertise in. So career linguistics, content linguistics, social linguistics, and anthropological linguistics have these concerns as well. And the questions that we address, we're attempting to address, and we have been addressing in this conference, are about variability. And so in that sense, it doesn't start in the lab. Language exists in its social context, in its ecological context, and it's wrapped in variability. So from that perspective, it's not that we're shifting from the lab to the field. My suggestion is that it's the, the other way around, and just to think about that a bit. But yet, researchers who work with the lab data and those who work with field data are both concerned about variability. We are equally concerned, and we're in the pursuit of science and scientific study and scientific rigor, rigor and whatever we think that is. Approaches to and concerns about variability, however, are different. And one example, random example, is that lab-oriented data focuses on constraining language, constraining in scare quotes, so that there can be replicability and comparability across categories, whatever those categories are. And current methods for fine-grained phonetic analyses have been tested, tried, proven, weighed in the balance and not found it wanting. And these have been refined through laboratory methods. So it's a very good thing. But when these methods have been applied to the field, we see some problems, challenges. So there's lots to learn from laboratory methods. But when we apply them to quote unquote field linguistics, we see these challenges. And so a part of my task today is to talk about what does this look like for Creole languages? And remember, I preface this by talking about language in its social context. And so part of what I'm going to be talking about and what I am saying is that we have to embrace that variability in all its wonderful flavor. So one of the first things I want to talk about is language and literacy in Creoles. Henninger suggests that a, a, a linguistic as well as socially acceptable writing system is problematic for Caribbean Creole languages, where the dominant and prestigious, I would say hegemonic, orthography of European languages have been there on challenge and have a long history. So the economic, cultural, psychological structure must be considered. Proficiency in English and other hegemonic languages traditionally are valued as a prerequisite for social advancement. Creoles are used for oral and oral communication as well as transmission of cultural practices. And where there is literacy, it's offered only in the hegemonic languages. However, the Creole languages and even these uh, are important for inter-ethnic communication. Esquire talks about this as uh, vital for the communication of um, historically black 
Belizeans who are descendants of slaves and new immigrants and Indians who are indigenous peoples. And Kathy and I talk about that in our work. We see a little bit of that later on. Ideologies about Creole languages as broken English, or even worse, absence of language from speakers, has persisted for a long time and is still pretty heavily relevant. And where am I going with this? It has something to do with the methodology. But in comes the Jamaica Language Unit. And one of the scholars, students out of this is Tamarind Delissa, who in 2016 had just delivered a new translation of Lois Curl's Adventures, Adventure in a Wonderland. So while Jamaica, many Jamaicans are fluently speaking Patwa, reading it is an entirely other matter. And this is a quote from the national newspaper, which was established since 1834. Here's another quote from the paper. To say that we will now teach the various subjects in Patwa because it is the only language they know is not only completely ridiculous and laughable, but also a sign of failure in our education system. As has become the norm in so many things in Jamaica today, we, do, we don't pursue excellence per se, but rather lower the bar of achievement to accommodate the inefficient, the slothful, and the undisciplined. Yet Patwa is well loved and a symbol of our identity and national pride, as the list shows. The same writer who had the item in blue says this, we all love Patwa and would never want to see it diminish or leave our shores, for it is indeed one of those things that bind us together as a people and make us quintessentially Jamaican. And this was around the time when the Jamaica Language Unit was bringing proposals to the Jamaican government for constitutional amendment to recognize the language rights of all people, irrespective of language. And so the Creole language got a seat at the table in that debate. Also, a part of the efforts of the Jamaica Language Unit was to work with several different international bodies to get, of all things, a translation of the Bible in Creole. And I'll, so one of the articles that came out in the newspaper was God Chad Patwa too. And what we're going to hear in a second is a reading. First Corinthians chapter 13. If we could have talked all of the language them in the world, I'll talk the language what the angels them use. But now I'm loving on my heart. We come in like one base or one metal pan. We just a make nice. All right, I hope you all went to Sunday school. <coughs> On Sunday, that was from 1 Corinthians 13, and that's a red version. And I will just say that a speaker who is reading this is well educated, he's well versed in the Bible, he is a practicing minister, and so he's literate. Here is what Jamaican Creole sounds like unscripted. Out of jail, take a listen to this. Come on, she and me, they are fine. I'm never All of us, so we kill one little raccoon. All of us, so everybody have all three raccoon. You understand? I did plant tree, you know, lucky, never see him out of road, come in this plant tree. Wait. This was August 2018, and this was not in Jamaica. This was Palm Bay, Florida. It's amazing. This is for Nicole. <coughs> Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Greetings, Massive. Hey. Wagwan, Jamaica. That's an example of why we need to get the prosody right. <laughs> I'm not to be able to switch back to this. Sorry. Okay. So Jamaican curl is used in different contexts, and it is totally learnable, and it's transnational, uh, as we heard from President Obama. So let's think about prosodic variability. So we heard some kind of prosody in the red text. We heard live, raw, Jamaican Creole. 
Typological classifications typically fall into four categories. Stress languages like Stranan, Trinidad, Dian, Jamaican, lexical tone languages, Saramac and Papiamento, picture word accents, Papiamento, Guyanese, both stress and lexical tone, Jamaican. So the classification differs based on the analyst and based on the time period in which you find these works. What is true though that there isn't a lot of, hasn't been a lot of instrumental work on these varieties. So there's also geographical variability. What we find is that there is, I think I skipped something, my eyes are not working. Um, so we have to look also at variability in terms of prosodic type. We see stress languages, lexical tone languages, pitch word accent. At the word level, we see uh, lexical tone, lexical stress, word accent. Phrase level prosody can be presence or absence of an accentual phrase, presence or absence of IPs, and people tend to agree for a large IP. But there's also geographical variability, so that what we see is Eastern versus Western Jamaican, rural versus urban, etc. People argue for substrate retention in languages like Saramacan and Stranan, um, Jamaican, Guyanese, and Trinidad, Trinidadian Creole. There's also ethno-linguistic variability. There's also issues of socioeconomic status, levels of education having to do with diglossia, whether or not somebody can read or not read, and this has been clearly established in the literature. There's also contact with other languages. So in San Andres and Providencia and in, in um, Costa Rica and Limon, the Creole is in contact with Spanish. But there's also contact amongst Creoles themselves in, in Suriname. So there's ethnolinguistic contact through intermarriages, rural, urban migration, all sorts of things that we need to consider. So sociolinguistic variability has implications for international variation. And so what we, do, we must do is to consider the possibility of influences on variability due to contact between languages as well as contact between different social spheres. There are also theoretical challenges with respect to variability on the contact and what exactly can change on a contact. And um, when I did my work with um, Kathy and Drayton and Mary Beckman, we talked a lot about that and I have the reference there for you. So what I'm gonna suggest is a method, not the method, one of the ways that we can do this. And so I'll take a review of Jamaican and then I will look at two studies that have adopted, adapted, done better what I did, um, advanced on it, and that is Iskra Iskrova's work in 2009 and Kathian's work on, in 2015 on Trinidadian Creole. And I'll also take a review of other methods used by other researchers for other Creole languages across the board. So for Jamaican, I typically work with spontaneous speech data, and there are several uh, sources of data out there available. The fieldwork data that I did focusing on a rural variety there's field work data that was made available to me by Peter Patrick, and this was done in the 1950s by David DeCamp and Fred Cassidy for the Dictionary of Jamaican English. There's also been elicited word list data and narrative data done by the Venetian Harry, and they use, for example, linguistically trained university students from different areas. Uh, there's also most recently made available corpus data um, called Ice Jamaica, and I anticipate starting to work on it as an urban variety. One of the issues that we'll see with some of this um, data is that they don't control for a lot of things, and so there are issues with that. In the camps data, this was recording between 1957 and 1959, and the interviews were from a wide range of parishes, including rural and urban locations, as well as maroon settlements. And so it gives you a nice basis to talk about uh, more conservative varieties and less conservative varieties. So in the things that I do, I use a broad phonemic transcription modeled on the Cassidy and LePage writing system, and also a modified Toby transcription. And I'm mentioning these because I let the data speak, and I probably also let my heart speak. And if I am doing a transcription with Toby and the thing is not working the way I should, I'm like, look, this is not what the data is showing. And so I go in that direction. So I built this annotation tool and I um, trained several annotators with this transcription system. And these were undergraduate students at Pitt, linguistically trained graduate students, and including a speaker of a tone language, Ms. Lee Fang Lai, who's sitting in the room. And I also had an experienced annotator who's a speech and hearing science person who's used to working on several languages. And these are the people who I worked with on the data. It included men and women at the time of recording between 29 years of age and 80. They were in a rural community, Top Alston, Clarendon, with which I was familiar 
I myself was born in that community. I have lots of community ties. The local church where I did a lot of my recordings, my grandfather and my uncle built it. The majority of the people are Basilic dominant and reported using Jamaican in most informal and social settings and English in most formal settings. So it was spontaneous speech elicited through a combination of what I'll call an elaborated interview style as well as a picture task. And the elicitations were framed in a narrative that I thought was culturally relevant and a format that speakers were used to. And all the interactions were done in Jamaican Creole. Because I was fully cognizant of the fact that I had left the community and I now speak a different, also a different variety, like the one I'm using now. But when we didn't feel me talk like this so that people don't confuse me and talk about so that they were also comfortable with me and that I didn't create the social distance between speakers and myself. I thought this was good, that the pictures helped to cue the desired target words, facilitated comparison across different productions for all speakers, and participants had a different, who had different degrees of literacy. I avoided any potential difficulties with reading and also removed the undesirable effect of alienating participants on the basis of literacy. The data was also elicited in a comfortable setting in a variety that speakers were used to using on an everyday basis. The not so good. <laughs> it was labor intensive. Elicitation took a long time and the context needed to be updated to elicit longer and longer sentences. So for example, it took an average of 45 minutes for each informant and up to an hour for unstructured spontaneous um, speech interactions. The task did not design did not work well for some older speakers. And you know, as you go back and you re reflect on what you thought was wonderful when you were young and younger and sprightier, <laughs> um, you begin to see a little bit some more flaws. So here are the context: citation form, broad focus, informational um, structure, yes/no questions, WH questions, and I had target words in final and non-final position. I was not able to get them in absolute um, phrase or clause initial perspective um, structure. I also had narrow focus constructions, complex sentences with several subordinated clauses, as well as sentences with multiple foci. And the ones in blue are in blue because though I did not elicit those, those were from the spontaneous speech um, set. And I had regular conversational data. I had to put on the conversational data because my older speakers, they could not do the task. And so I picked a discourse um, topic and we talked about it. So here's what I did, the doctor and the clinic. In rural communities in Jamaica, once per month, there are free health clinics. And people are often needing to go and, as we say, set their name down. You write your name in a book, and that's how you get to see the doctor. If your name is not in the book, you can't see the doctor. If you know the person, you can go and sweet talk them and get in. And the health issues vary each month. And so what I did first is to give a picture and it would do something like this, all in Creole. You ever see people like them, yeah? First question. All right, what then call them? And I would get something like Bingy Man. And then the participants were told, one doctor come next week, we look after them people, yeah? Picture. And you, you get the job if you find them. Give people the message so that he want them people, yeah? And so, what I get is broad focus. He wants one belly woman. He wants a pregnant woman for examination. That's what he wants on this occasion. Um, non-final, and I realized that my uh, final. I realized that my non-final one did not come out. But it's he wants. Uh, the context becomes the doctor is greedy, and he knows that you are in a farming community where yams are planted, and so he wants some of that too. And so the telling of the people becomes. He wants some pregnant woman and some yam. So suddenly it's now in um, a non-final position. And then with the question, you see the doctor face to face and you ask him, hey, I know where these people are. So the question becomes, do you want some X or do you want some X and some yams? Here is a sample of a 40-year-old male. His um, question intonation and his um, yes, no question intonation and his broad focus, the clarity overlaid. They look pretty similar. All he's doing there is manipulating pitch range. They're both in a pretty high pitch range and he's just manipulating pitch range. I also managed to get some focus constructions. I didn't intend to get these, but I'm listening to them. I, got, I saw that that's what they were. And this was with my eight-year-old uh, speaker. 
you get, here was a target um, alligator. It should be, you want some alligator and some yam. Broad focus, but I got, you want some alligator and some yam. And I see this bump up here. If you compare it to the thing on the right, there's no focus there. So this is the intended thing, but the speaker says this. And so I started looking at this to see, you know, what's going on with this focus. Here's another example from another speaker in her mid-30s, and this is, you want some yams for your mother. Here is a speaker in her sixes that's doing something else with focus. What we saw was in situ focus. Here's another focus construction. But what we see here, and what is different about this, you get asan yam that for your mother. What we get is syntactic reorganization. And this is interesting because in the Creole literature, that's all people talk about is syntactic reorganization. And so what I was able to do through these elicitations was to show that there is another option. And in fact, Bickerton made this staunch claim that you cannot do this kind of thing with prosody. It's impossible with Creole languages. So I was excited to see that. So here's another speaker, SG, mysterious speaker, 29 years old, who's also from that community, getting a syntactic reorganization thing, a yellow yam, the goli got. The calabash has yellow ones, and no other color but yellow. So based on that, I was able to come up with um, all kinds of classifications for um, pitch accents. Uh, you see a variety there, and argue that there was uh, three levels of phrasing that I had evidence for. I'm not saying there aren't any more, but these are the ones I have evidence for. In Trinidad and Creole, um, Kathian's work basically mimicked mine, but she took a brave step, and she pioneered the use of my methods, but using red speech. And perhaps the reason she did this is Trinidad has typically been classified as being less conservative than Jamaican, and so it likely facilitated this choice. She had people read lists of words three times for monomorphic words, and then she did comfort words um, in red sentences in different positions. And she collected um, data from a wide variety of speakers from different communities, ranging in age from 29 to 59 years old, and they identified differently as African, Indian, or mixed. So she's trying to engage with the different kinds of variations in the community. In Iskra's work, um, she noted that the majority of the population were bilingual, although the level of command of French was very different based on education, social interactions, and socioeconomic status, and that there were also monolingual Creole speakers, and she had all of these um, different types of speakers in her data set. Like Jamaican, the, the writing system that people commonly use are, is etymological, and the speakers with little exposure to written English, uh, written French, sorry, have difficulties with spelling conventions that they're not exposed to. So she came up with this brilliant plan as a modification on what I did. She had female names, male names, and verbs trying to get to things as most sonorous as possible. And then she had these figures, Melon, Like Her Love, and Lynn. So all there were were pictures. And so she had this training session where people were trained on what these things meant. And then she put them in a sentence. Lynn likes melons. No writing, and that's all speakers did. Or, Melanie called Lynn's mother, who is listless, just by pictures. And so she was able to get a lot more data faster, not 45 minutes, a lot more speakers. She had a monolingual Creole speaker who was illiterate in French, no problems. With um, Papiamento, it has a writing system and that has been established for a very long time. And it's also used in the education system. It has both distinctive stress and lexically contrastive tone and has been pretty much established in the literature. In Rivera, Castillo, and Pickering's um, work, they use 16 declarative statements in carrier sentences divided into three varying sets so they could get stress and tone or stress and or tone distinctions. And these are the kinds of things that they use. So minimal tri triplets like pisca, that has both stress and tone. Pisca, that has stress here, tone here. Pisca, that has initial stress and tone. And you get the idea. And then they have these in sentences that people read. Bert Remisen, I think, has this wonderful knack for finding languages with understudied um, <laughs> properties. And so he also looked at um, Papiamento. And 
he looked at things, six target words, he looked at things in sentence final position, default focus, sentence medial position, default focus, sentence medial position, etc. You see the long list there. He was able to take advantage of the fact, like others, that there was an established long history of a writing system. So sentences were presented on paper. But what he did also was that each target sentence was elicited by means of a precursor question. And so what he asked people to do is to enact this dialogue, but do it in a way where the reading style is not detectable. And so that's what we have. In Palenquero, uh, Hyman and Schregler's work was based on the sociolinguistic fieldwork done by Schregler in 1988. And they had monolingual Creole speakers as well as bilingual speakers who switched between uh, Palenquero and Spanish. But there is more work coming on stream and Wilmar Lopez over there is gonna be telling us more in a couple years about what's happening with Palenquero. So new methods. Uh, narratives, my proposal is that we have to do narratives framing these tasks and that they must be interactive. And we know this because of um, what I've tested and, and shown, but also um, Junan Fletcher's um, commentary on this, on doing prosody in fieldwork languages tells us this. Helmuth and Ladd also talk about this as well. What we've shown is that you can use picture-based tasks, but as Lee Fen shows in her dissertation work, these picture-based tasks must be interactive. I have a confession, and have it there in red. Though writing is valuable, I have a theoretical ideological issue with respect to written elicitation methodologies in our field that privilege writing, precisely because of the sociolinguistic context that I talked about with Jamaican. Mm -hmm. If you put writing, it elevates, it, 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 it elevates this image of English, but yet writing is available or should be available to all languages, but given the social context, there are all kinds of ideological differences that happen there. And so any methodology that I would introduce in a Jamaican context, even despite the work of the Jamaican language unit, I am still uncomfortable. I'll just leave it at that. So courts, crowdsource data, yay, but I'm like, uh, because that means access to the internet, it means reading, it means access to technology, so all of those. Rapid prosody transcription is something that is suggested to be good for research on lesser studied or indigenous languages. And this is something, again, that I have to test, given my particular ideologies, I should say. Force alignment methods, they're not there yet. Over the years, I've kind of put it around with stuff, created and tested tiny ones over the years. And so, yeah, potential. So in summary, um, take home the baby. <laughs> <laughs> or the old man or woman, <laughs> but toss the bathwater. What we want is the ability to replicate studies, compare language data across many speakers and many varieties, right? Um, but any methodology we must use must be sensitive to speakers' ecological context. In the context that we see for Creole languages, ecological differences can lead to wide differences in phonological variation. Speakers' uses then reflect coexistence, at least in Jamaica, Creole and English, while at the same time, they maintain ideological boundaries, right? So somebody who is a speaker of Jamaican English will be careful to say, I can't do that or can't do that, but they will never say, I, I can't do that because saying can signals them and marks them as coming from a rural area, but they've moved to town and so they're moving into this newer social context that demands English, and so they're gonna avoid certain features. They will also be careful to say hammer and not hammer for the thing you pound the nail in with. And that's it. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions. First from students. Students and postdocs. <laughs> Anybody? The floor is open. Hi, Nicole Holiday from Winter College. I like this talk so much. Um, I was really struck by the quote that you put up about um, 
we have to lower the bar to accommodate the undisciplined. Like that's what it means like to teach Creole or to have literacy in Jamaican Creole. Um, you know this, but it's exactly the same argument that you get against African American English. So like during the Abonic controversy when there was all of this press, um, it was like uh, there was the art the picture in the New York Times. Uh, that was supposed to reference Martin Luther King, and it had text that says, I had the dream. And it's, the implication is, how cool, Martin Luther King would have never spoken like this. But of course, he commanded African American English too. Not just speeches, you know, not in speeches, right? Um, so I wonder, sort of, in thinking about all of these issues, mm -hmm. we've talked a little bit about how Jamaican Creole um, linguistics is, is more popular these days um, at the University of the West Indies. But how do you work around these ideologies that are in the public when you're actually eliciting data from the speakers? Because they're still in their mind living in the context of all of this. And this is a problem that we have with African American language speakers too, right? Which is that like they know and they command the variety, but the stigma is always there in the back of their mind because it's like in the air that we breathe, right? Right, so there is, so one of the things that the Jamaica Language Unit did is to bring empirical forces to some of these thoughts that people have. So if you talk to Jamaicans, they have a strong sense that there are two languages, right? So there's a patois and there's an English. In my field work, you, there, were, there was one particular woman who the community chose to block from my study. They chose to block her. And their rationale was, don't let Miss Joyce in. She, she's always thinking that she's better than us because she's always walking around here talking in English, mm -hmm. right? And so for them, she, she, she was in a rural context and when I presented myself to the community, I said, I'm interested in the patwa. A patwa business may I deal with, right? So they immediately picked her out of the, the whole community and said, well, you definitely don't want her. So they have a sense of these two varieties. They also have a sense of, oh, some people around here think they use the, the English, but they really don't, right? So the Jamaica Language Unit did this large survey where they, they asked people about languages. They asked people about bilingualism. They asked people about the value of being educated in these two things. So what they did is this really rapid survey. Over one weekend, they surveyed like 500 people across the entire island. The entire linguistics department, undergrads, and these really were trained and sent out en masse. And they just went to bus stops, marketplaces, and they, they wonderful survey. Um, and people agreed. But don't try to tell me that my kids should go to school and learn this. But the person who wrote in the news, so this is gonna talk about writing. The person who has a time to sit down, compose something in English, submit it to the editors of the journal, of the newspaper, is somebody who is upholding the status quo, is somebody who themselves is speaking a standard Jamaican English. The people, most of the people at the bus stops and in these different country <coughs> areas, they're not writing to the gleaner. They're listening to it. If you go to an interview, then you'll hear stuff. So those are the people who, who filled out the survey. The educated people, the people who are of who are of this higher social classes. They're not. Alison Irvin's um, work in one of the top manufacturing companies in Jamaica shows that even when people are using standard Jamaican English, they're doing this kind of sliding scale thing between um, sounding Jamaican, but at the same time avoiding stigmatized varieties. So they will not say garden and cat for garden and cart. They will say garden and cart. They will not say dog, they say dog, right? And they're very careful in, and so she calls the, she calls these like, the, almost the gatekeeping phonological items. And so a part of it is that, is there a gatekeeping prosody? Hubert definitely suggests that the prosody is the thing that slides by, because you focus so much on, and this is all empirical, uh, it can be empirically tested, of course, that these things slide by and people don't get it. But of course, I can stand here and talk forever about it because I'm so passionate about it. And, it's, and again, it's bringing in this thing about methodologies because when I go into field and I want to do this, I come to conferences and I hear all this wonderful stuff and I want to do it and I want to find ways in which to modify this to get at the data and get at the replicability that we so desire. But when I have people coming into the room and saying to me, Miss, 
can I, can I please be a part of your study? Me can't read enough. I can't read, but can I please be a part of your study? <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting emotional. Because this, it's hard. I am a part of the, something else is going on here. By virtue of the way that I speak, I'm also a part of that group. And so as a researcher, I feel like I have a strong responsibility to engage with this. And Hubert Devinish, too, one of the reasons that he, he ran the Jamaican Language Unit is to say, look, the system of power says that writing is a thing that gets you in there. And so to get a seat at that table, he said, look, if people think that language should have a dictionary, okay, let's get one. If people think that language should have a grammar book, let's get one. If people think that a language should have a writing system, let's get one. Everything that we should do for a language, if you need an army and a navy, let's lobby the government and put it on the books and say, if we want to um, embrace people's rights, hey, language rights is one of those. If you want to tell people about their histories, Guess what? When the enslaved Africans came to Jamaica, they didn't leave the languages on the, sh on the shore. So that's a part of your history as well. And so it's not just the syntax. It's not just a thing. So again, it's this variability. And, and everything that people feel and people engage with is a part of that variability and a part of what builds language and a part of what we are all after with this variability. And my, my thing is that we do have these wonderful methodologies in the lab, but how do we get them in a way that we can do this and do justice to the communities that we serve, that we research, and like John Rickford said, that got us our jobs and our tenures and our promotions. So I, I like the point about replicability and comparing, but I'm just wondering, there's, a, there's considerable emphasis placed on that, but we want to know about the language itself. I mean, mm -hmm. I could, I don't really care if people are comparing what I get to others, mm -hmm. but I want to know what speakers know when they know a particular variety. Right. So these methodologies, I think, should be used, should be telling us something about what speakers know, something right. about the system. Mm -hmm. And also, um, it seems like, you know, when we talk about these varieties, languages, we sort of enter at adulthood. But what's happening with children who are mm -hmm. developing it? Right. I mean, so those are a number of issues, too, that I think we right. need some methodologies. One more thing here. Yeah. Um, so, um, can you not find a community? Because I mean, I, I find that, I mean, and when we talk about African American English, I always hear that, you know, people don't want other people to know that they use some particular variety. It's stigmatized. It's true. But I mean, if I go to my community in Louisiana, the people there are not wondering whether or not I'm coming to check their subject for review. Mm -hmm. So people do just talk. Yeah, they do. You know, they do just right. talk, and I, you know, and people, they talk. Yep. And maybe the thing about Louisiana, maybe people, you know, are thinking, well, I just, I just talk when I talk. Yep. So it's true that you definitely find those issues, mm -hmm. but there are communities where people talk, and talking is a part of who they're talking is a part of of who they are. And so the language they have is the language that they're going to use. I understand that you know there's people can be at different places on the continuum, but some people, the language they have is the language they're going to use. They're not always reaching to what's taken to be the standard. Right, right. But, but you find that in some communities. But right. There must be some teeny pockets where you don't have to go in and worry about whether or not you know somebody's trying to be more standard. No, no. What I meant is that if we introduce methodologies for writing, right, the Creole writing system is only used within the confines of the university and for the people at the Jamaica Bible Society. It was never meant to be a generally public thing, right, at first. So if I introduce anything with writing, I'm going to get a block. If I'm going in to talk to people, no problem. People are going to be talking to me. But if I introduce methodologies for writing, the, the writing system that, that's there they did some pilot testing, we were like, watch this. But after the initial part, they're like, oh, I can do this, right? And so our people are beginning to warm to this idea that, hey, this is my thing. And oh, look, it's written down. And hey, there's a Bible. First it was, 
all of you, your souls are going to burn in hell for, <laughs> for translating God's word into this lower status, barefoot kitchen language. But I think you had your hand up. You had your hand up before. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, okay. uh, I like your point. Of, um, I really appreciate your point about literacy. And one thing, and I am very much a proponent of looking at natural speech, narrative speech, and it's something that in the documentation, I do a lot of this. One of the things that comes up and probably comes up in your situation mm -hmm. I'm curious about is there's this move in uh, if you take a model of like laboratory research, there's been this movement towards pre-registration of your control in your experimental paradigm. Mm -hmm. And how that translates for field work data where you don't have a control, you're looking at narrative data, you're looking at conversations. And whether it be sociolinguistic surveys or whatever it is, I don't know that that there's an answer out there. I'm curious what you think of mm -hmm. this. If you're familiar with that sort of debate around register all of your um, all of your controls around things, um, I'm really bothered by this. I guess. Right? Yeah. So I'm curious of what your thoughts are. This movement towards. Uh, establish all of the all of the metrics for your design before you go in, because we're t we're sort of taking too much from the laboratory approach, and there's things that I think that might be left. I'm not sure what my <laughs> my my real thought is at this juncture, but um, one of the things I'm taking a leaf from Himmelman and Ladd, and then noticing that it had kind of crossed back to some of the stuff that I'd done, that you end up doing both things, right? So you have spontaneous speech. Sure narrative type things. One of the things I've done too is to pick one particular topic and different speakers talk about the same topic so you can do you know, topic comparisons and hopefully some of the same words or phrases will come up. But you also do that alongside elicited data, right? And so the thing here is how you elicit that data. And as we saw with the different methodologies that different researchers use, because they had advantages of having uh, lang Creole languages with longer written histories, then they, they have it. But at the same time, for example, in Remesen's work and the others, they're saying, when you do it, make sure you don't have a reading style. And a part of that is, I think, um, may not be answering your question, that there are speakers in the community whose speech may or may not be reflected in that. And so, and that's the same for, for anywhere else. It's just that in these cases, I think that you have, and in a lot of indigenous communities, you can listen to Lee Fine's talk uh, tomorrow with her work on Yami, that it's when you have these interfaces with the, with the educational system and what that might mean for people's social identities and how that interfaces them with exactly what you're looking at. There's a lot. And so there's also a part of me that says, how much can we really control, right? And in a sense, it's kind of um, feigned control because as a linguist, we say, yes, we do this. But as Lisa said, what we're trying to do is to describe what's out there. And I think we just start with a little bit, which is what we've always done, and then see how we can move to the whole. Time for maybe one more quick one. Or comment, or suggestion. I saw Stephanie smiling a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Take a moment to observe smiling. <laughs> I could probably wake one my own comment that <clears throat> perhaps a part of my um, emotional <laughs> um, outpouring is that um, <clears throat> there are speakers who, when they use a particular, when they use a Creole, it comes with you're immediately judged for just like in African American English. And if you use those in public spaces, then you lose access to all kinds of things. And this is still for the same populace that tells you we have two languages. And this is a, so you, you see how complex these ideologies get. Um, and so if you haven't had a, you know, in your rumblings, if you haven't looked at Hubert Devonish's work on this, he talks about it uh, in one of his books, Language and Liberation. And he talks about this policing of language through these kinds of systems. And so I guess a part of what I'm saying is that as researchers, as analysts, we also have to have that unto that even in what we do in the methodologies that we apply, that we don't um, advance 
some of these um, constraints on, on minority and indigenous um, language speakers. Constraints, restraints, some, some kind of strengths. <laughs> All right. Okay. So. Thank you.